benefit. Thank you for being here tonight. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. My name is Sean San Jose. I work at the Magic Theater. <laughs> Eighty-five percent beautiful people. I don't mean like eighty-five percent of you are beautiful. I mean eighty-five percent. Coma's coming on soon. It's gonna be cool. We're gonna have a good time. Honestly, thank you so much for for coming out tonight. I know it's a, a strange time, but it's a beautiful time. It's a rebirth time. We're all yeah. Come on, come with me. Yeah. It. It's theater. People are like, it's easy. The fruit are like down here. <laughs> I fucking say anything. I walked down the street today. Yeah! <laughs> uh, don't worry, my set will end soon. Tina, this is amazing. But this is what it is. This is what the Bay Area Theater is. It's, it's family community like this. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for making this happen. Um, so what we're doing, we, we've just opened up at the Magic Theater. So if you go to the edge of the city, on the other side, the less fancy building, we have an old, funky, beautiful building out there, but our good friends over here at ACT, uh, where are Pam and Jennifer, where are they at? Where are they at? There. So, this is their joint, this is their house, and that's the same ethos that we operate on. It's about houses, it's about homes, it's about opening up your homes, it's about building families, and with families you can build communities, and with communities you can do fucking anything. And so that's what we're trying to do at Magic Theater. And what you're here for, I know you're here for Coleman, but you're also here to make this magical work happen. So thank you for doing that. And thank you for sharing the night with us. And it's going to be wild. This is fucking wild, just looking at this crowd of people who showed up for this. But tonight is going to be great because it, it really is about family and it's about journey. And, and like I said, it's about rebirth. So we're, we're getting tonight... Is Coleman Domingo, the, the most beautiful soul in the world, really, like, you know. And if you don't know him, I know him. So we are going to talk shit tonight. So it is not entertainment tonight, but we will be entertaining tonight. So before all the, the, the everything that comes out, the, you know, this is a a writer, a creator, a producer, obviously an amazing performer. He's got his own production company, Tony nominated, Independent Spirit nominated, Oscars don't know what the fuck they doing, not nominated. But we're gonna talk about all of that and much more, but before we do that and we crack it all open and get into the Philly soul that is Coleman Domingo, we want you to get a taste of who we're gonna to talk to tonight. So we're gonna see this and then we'll bring out the Shining the star ball, Coma D'Amico. So, thanks for joining us. Here he is. The shining the star there is, Coma Domingo! Hello, friends. Good to see you. Good to be here, you guys. With my bestie over here. Yay! Uh, now, it's Coleman. I told him we're going to do it real, so you got no other choice. Okay. <laughs> so, um, this is the coming home, but what we want to do is we want to do a little different because we're going to spend a lot of time talking about Coleman's time here, his roots, and what, 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 what got him to fly out into the world. But I actually want to do it in reverse with you, Coleman, and if we can start kind of like with today. Because that was, was that impressive or what? That's a... I mean, I've been, I, I watch everything he does and the, his ability to grow and grow and create a... A new, a new level of the craft is just stunning to me. And the world recognizes it too, so I kind of want to start there. And we heard last week, uh, Mama Oprah. 
brought him out. And so Coleman Domingo, who uh, uh, the first performance that I ever saw him do was in the low-down gutter basement of Theater Rhinoceros. Not the gutter. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't the regular Theater Rhinoceros. It was, it was the low. low yeah. It was the low, low. It was the, were here. It was the 50 was theater, here. theater underground. Was there. Off, off, off. Oh. Under, 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 under. Yes. And now the, the world recognizes and sees it. And, and so what, what is that? Tell us about the color purple, boy. Well, hello. Hey, well, it's beautiful. I'm about to, um, I leave on Wednesday, actually, to go to Atlanta to go and shoot uh, the musical version of The Color Purple. Um, thank you. And I'm blessed to play the character of Mr., which is great. And um, yeah, it feels good. For those who may not know, uh, Fantasia will be playing Seeley. I'm playing Mr. Taraji P. Henson is playing Shogiva. Uh, Danielle Brooks is, uh, is Sophia. Corey Hawkins is Harpo. You got her playing Squeak. And you got um, Haley Bailey playing uh, Nettie. So, uh, so we're in for a treat. And so it's produced by Quincy Jones and Steven Spielberg and Oprah Winfrey and Warner Brothers. And we, we get started on this big epic journey um, Wednesday. I, I, I drive back tomorrow to L.A., Pack my bags and I go to to I'll shoot all over Georgia. We're gonna go to some uh, who's who write, you know what who's writing it? Someone. The most beautiful thing is the way I'll talk about how we keep coming back together. One of my dear friends, Marcus Gardley, <laughs> that you all know as well. So it is everything. All roads lead back to the Bay. I think in many ways. Um, so it's beautiful. Amazing, and t tell, tell him what you've been rehearsing, what you've been practicing and learning. I've been, something that he's been clowning me on is that, um, because and he, he just, you should see how he fills my inboxes on the daily. It, it's, you know, I'm, I'm, you, <laughs> with, with all love, but I'm, I'm playing the banjo right now. So for some reason, every time I'm doing, I do a film, they throw an accent at me or another instrument. And I'm always just like, I don't know how to play that. Did, did they know that I didn't know how to play? Okay, well, I guess they're going to teach me how to play this. So that's, that's what I'm doing right now. You know, he, he grew banjo. up in West Philadelphia, West Philly, so there wasn't near a banjo in sight. So <laughs> the, the journey he's on, the journey, the tedious journey. So that, that, that's amazing, Coleman. And, and for those of you who don't know, you know, Coleman is, is everything. I'm obviously in love with him. But Coleman... <laughs> Not only writes, produce, and direct, perform, but he sings and dances. I don't know if you've seen him on, on Broadway. So doing a musical on film ain't nothing to you, right? No, but it's, but it's funny because I think that people forget they know you in different ways. You know, they, everybody knows, all these artists in here, you know that some people know you from such um, smaller networks of things that you do. Like people may know me from sketch comedy or they know, they know me from musical theater, or they know my film work, but suddenly it's been, kind of, it's been kind of amazing to me that lately I've been a discovery, and I've been work, I'm like, I've been working for 32 years, when people like constantly, well, I didn't know Coleman sang, I didn't know, I'm like, I have a full career. You, you just woke up to me one day. You, you know what I mean? Like, you just woke up, or people, I didn't know he was, it's a lot of, I didn't know to call him, I didn't know, I'm like, what was I supposed to tell you? I don't know, I, I, there's something called Google, I think. <laughs> you know, right? <laughs> right? I didn't even egg you on, here you go, off to the races. <laughs> right. right? No, but it's also, it shows, we were trying to just give a, a little flavor, a little taste of what he does. It, the, the range, the range, darling, <laughs> it's, it's amazing. What? Well, let me tell you this, and now this is some real talk. I think I do, and I recognize this, I'm not just saying this because I'm here, but where I began my journey as an artist was here in the Bay Area, where I wasn't, I wasn't marginalized in any way. I had so many people saying, you can do this, you can, you can learn Shakespeare, you can do this, you can sing, you can do comedy, you can do drama, you can do... There was nothing put on me saying, oh, we limit you and we only see you as this six foot two tall, black, openly gay man. I, I think that I, I, I came of age as an artist with artists, which is why we're so close as well, who said, you can do anything. And so I think 
at my core, I know that that's unique for me. When I left the Bay Area and went out into the world, I walked around like I can do anything. And so then I would, you know, meet sometimes, we'll get into this in a deeper way, but, you know, casting people and everything who put limits on what I did, I didn't understand. So I would create for myself. And I would keep creating outside the box and producing and making things happen. Because I thought, oh, no, no, no. No one could put limits on me because I, I, I can't put them, I didn't put them on myself. And my community didn't put them on me. So that's why I'm able to go out into the world and do all these things and, and play in different sandboxes is because of the foundation that started right here. Wow. Amazing. But it's also, I mean, there's something so transcendent about you, and, and it does break all these boundaries. So if we step back, one step back in time, we, we start with Color Purple. So with Zola, which is just amazing. Thank you. I mean, just incredible. And for those of us that, that watch and, 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 and track his career through screen, now Zola's out the box in every single way possible. But also casting... Coleman Domingo in, in the part of X. So wh what does that take? Does it take, you know, simpatico? Does it take a sister to look at you and be like, this, this, yeah, I know you could do this other level thing that no one is ready for. It, it takes um, thinkers. I feel like I work with the most unique artists and people who think outside the box. And they're already, the rain is already on fire with like, a who, who do they want to bring into the room? So then Janik Sabravo, the co-writer and director of this, it was a simple ask, like, Coleman, could you meet me for lunch? She sent a script. Um, my husband, who also runs our production company, he reads everything first. And he read it and said, this is for you. And, so, and, I, I, and I'm like, oh, OK. So then I read it. And I thought, oh, my gosh. I read the first five pages. I'm like, this is bonkers. This is, <laughs> this is incredible. I'm like. And she wants me. Now, I literally just finished doing a press tour for If Bill Street Could Talk, one of the most <laughs> loving, generous fathers on the planet. And I said, well, what does she see in me that, that knows I could do this? But that goes back to earlier casting when I would go out for every character on Nash Bridges. And I remember this one time I went out. Not and for Nash some, for some for, Yeah, for Nash. I remember I went out for Nash Bridges, and there, I went in to play a young, um, probably Joan Spangler sent me in, and she, she sent me in to play this um, wonderful young attorney. And the director looks at me and is like, and he was, he's British, I'll never forget this. He was like, oh, that's interesting. Could you, I have some other sides. Could you go, I have some other sides. Barbie, Barbie Stein was the casting director. Bobby, um, could, you, could you give Coleman the other sides? And the sides were for a schizophrenic heroin addict. <laughs> what you see in me? But I booked the role. And so, 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 okay. so apparently people see me as something that maybe I don't see myself. But, like, but I think people see me as someone who can sort of paint outside of the you know, lines a little bit. So I think that that's been part of my superpowers in some way. So I think that Janixa saw something. She saw that I was available and that I, I wouldn't put something on a character. And I think the thing that I, I know for sure that I'm interested in doing even as I get ready to approach a character, I've been doing my research and prep work for Color Purple, is how can I humanize this villain? Mm -hmm. This obviously broken individual who's doing horrible things. How can I humanize him? So with the character of X, the first thing I talked about was like, well, you know what? I think that I would approach it as an immigrant story from X's point of view. I said, yeah, he's a, he's a, you know, maybe this guy doesn't have papers and everything he found that trafficking women, it was something that he knew how to do and he needed to gain agency in the world and, and that's what he did because he wanted what everyone else wants. I didn't judge him from the outside. So I think already we're, we were simpatico mm -hmm. in understanding character and like, oh yeah, he, but he also, I always, always want to challenge audiences to think, especially a character like, in, like X and Zola, and the editor said this, she says, is it wrong that I kind of, I'm kind of into X? It's wrong. <laughs> he's doing terrible things. She, you, know, you know, he's horrible, but I'm charmed by it. But I thought that for me, that was my goal, was to like, for me, that makes these women very smart in this film. It's like these are these smart, smart, incredibly smart young women who get 
I was going to use the word gaffled, <laughs> by this dude who's manipulating them. But he's, got to, he's using charm. He's using all these things. He's, he's sly, and he's doing all this. But for my money, it, makes, it, it continues to elevate you know, the feminist that I am as it elevates these women and say, they're smart. This person who is just thinking a little bit outside and moving around and tricking them a little bit, you know? So that's yeah, but, but what you're also talking about is, is being a storyteller within a bigger structure. Now, any of us that, that do theater know that in theater, you're telling the, the whole, whatever, whoever's up here, we're telling one story. That single story shit is not cutting it, and you're going to be out of pocket if you do that. But from the outside, you know, a viewer like me, I, I think that seems like the way in to do a film. Like, whoever can shine the most, whoever can kind of flex the most on the screen to get the editor to get hype. But what is it, like, how do you hold on to the, the part of you that is like, I mean, you just, he just described Zola, not, and X steal the whole shit in a certain respect. But nothing about it is like, well, X, dude, you know how actors are. There's a whole bunch of us out here tonight, you know, like, well, it's a story of journey of what I did when I thought about, you know. Like, All right, Pimpin, but what is the story about? Um, <laughs> you're able to hold on to that. Like, the whole thing that he just described to us was about the women, because that's what the story is about. It's about the women. And well, so how I, do you do that? You know what I think? I do, honestly, again, I keep, and I, I'm going to do this because it makes sense, because it's all part of my foundation being here. I think where it's about looking at the whole story. I think the way I came into this industry was someone, I, did, I don't have any professional training for anything that I'm doing. You know, but I learned by showing up to rehearsals at Cal Shakes when I wasn't asked to be in rehearsal, but I would sit in the back and I would watch Sharon Lockwood make this joke work out. And I would ask questions, and I would ask, you know, all my colleagues and people who are doing it, well, how do I do that? You know, Joan Menken would tell me, well, Coleman, you know, it's like this. And, you know, comedy is very hard. It takes a good seven years. Coleman, listen, watch the way I do this. So, you know what I mean? So I would really listen to all these people and because it was my conservatory. So I think that that's what I do still. So I'm always looking at the whole picture, like you are. I feel like I'm always looking at everything, and it's not just the function of my character. You know, so I feel like, and maybe that's, it's funny, I got a note from um, one of my directors recently, um, well, I'll just say, from George C. Wolf when I was doing the Rustin film. Um, that's so name droppy. I just threw that out there. I can't even believe I just did it. I didn't mean to do she, that, but She's yeah. keeping me on my that notes. Was, that was so cheap, <laughs> but you know, no, I just, I just did, did this film, but Rustin, only because it's right, just yeah. a reference okay, that just that. No, I got it. It's, it's about Bayard Rustin, and it's um, directed by George C. Wolfe, and it'll come out this year. And you are And Bayard I'm playing Rustin. Bayard Rustin, yes. It's with, for Netflix and, um, you know, a little known company that is run by Barack Obama and Michelle Obama. Yes, yes, so, but... I Getting like back you. to the story. I like you. <laughs> no, I, I think that, no, he, he told me one time, he said, Coleman, he said, because he, he, he challenged me to actually be a bit more selfish, to be honest, and to know that, you know, you, you're the center of this, and sometimes you've got to let the other actors come back up. You can't be responsible to everyone and everything. And, and it, in, in a strange way, sort of like, bothered me a little bit because I'm like, that's, but that's where I live. I live thinking about all of us. And I didn't, almost didn't know how to do it. I understood what he meant and had to figure out that balance on how to do that thing, but also still take care of everyone like I wanted to. Because that's just, it didn't make sense to the way I operate. So you know what I mean? I mean, kind of. I do little plays and shit, so. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, but... But absolutely. I mean, d just the fact that we can sit here with Coleman, he's still Coleman, this is still the same person that he used to be, just lets me know. I mean, because uh, Hollywood's madness. Right. The whole system is fucking madness, man. Mm -hmm. Especially for a black man, a black queer man, it's fucking madness. They're doing everything they can to not let you shine and not let you do your thing. You keep climbing up the mountain, climbing to the top of the mountain, and look... Look how he comes out. Same, same beautiful soul he always was. That's the accomplishment. That's the dream. I mean, that's real. Thank you. No, that, that, that's, that's 100. What does he mean, 100? Um, <laughs> it's a mixed theater audience tonight. <laughs> but also, what you're talking about, about 
you know, sort of placing yourself within it to, to use then, so it, it, every, everybody that got a, a bootleg code to HBO or actually pays for the HBO joint <laughs> has seen Coleman just, I mean, just, just, just kill you on Euphoria. Now everyone's, I mean, just amazing. But in that, you're so, uh, as character-wise, function-wise, you're, you know, you're, you are on the outer ring or at the inner, inner, innermost core of that. Does, is that, so how did you think about the story that way, which is clearly following the, these youngsters? I mean, she still look young, but they're really young. All right, this is on my list of things I can't say. I have a list of, of words that I was supposed to, I broke like eight of them. Like, don't cuss, don't call her she, don't say, I'm just, I'm halfway there. I'm, I'm, Don't let Coleman he's, gather he, me mid-show. He's, he's not going to make it. He's not going to make it, just so you know. I think, well, first of all, you guys... This I'm is sure not Jimmy Kimmel. You, again, the, the way the world keeps coming back around is, first of all, as we know that um, Zendaya and I met when she was five years old, and I was playing Autolycus at Cal Shakes. Yeah. You didn't know that? I don't know what the play is you're you referring the, to, but... <laughs> well, you Shakespeare. know, Winter's Tale. This is you know, a little bit of Shakespeare. Well... Because, because I'm sitting with Zendaya, I just got to tell the story because it's just interesting and it's very specific. Is I'm, I'm sitting with Zendaya, season one, we're sitting on a stair after like waiting for a setup of something. And um, she said, where, where are you from? I said, you know, I'm from New York, whatever, you know. I said, where are you from? She said, I'm from the Bay Area. I said, oh, I used to live in the Bay Area. Oh, yeah, really? Oh, my mom used to run um, box office uh, for Cal Shakes. I said, get out of here. I was a Cal Shakes for many years. I know Cal Shakes. And I said, really? Oh, my gosh. You know, I used to... When I was a little girl, I used to love watching this one show, and this guy used to come up on, like, what, a scooter or something like that? And I was like, what? And she said, I said, how are you? She said, I don't know, maybe five or something. I used to go see the show. I said, what? And when I tell you, this memory came in, in my brain, of getting off that scooter, coming up to the Festival Glen. You know, they had me playing with everybody out there. I don't know what I was doing, but I, just, I was wearing all white, and looking like Evil Knievel, <laughs> I hopped off. And I remember there was this little girl. And she couldn't have been more like, who is this five-year-old out here? Shakespeare, <laughs> Festival Glen, 9 p.m., who is this? And it was a few times. And she called her mom. And she said, Mom, what was the name of that show? What was the name of the show that I loved so much? And she was like, Winner's Tale. And I was like, that was me. That was me. So we've known each other for so long. And we've become very close. And I love that I actually get to play a role. The, the role of Ali was written for me by Sam Levinson based on uh, someone who really meant the world to him, who really helped him in his struggles as a, as a teenage um, person dealing with the disease of addiction. And um, he would just tell me, I met Sam Levinson actually in the basement of Sundance after I did this film, A Birth of a Nation. And we, we sat in the corner and we just talked, talked, talked. I didn't know who he was. We just talked, talked, talked about everything. And then he first wrote a role for me in, in this movie called Assassination Nation. And then when Euphoria was coming around, Raul and I were just talking about this today, um, that Euphoria came around and, you know, I'm on a show called Fear the Walking Dead and I've been on it for years now. And I was like, oh, it looks like it's not going to work out. They, you know, the dates I'm shooting right now, they're like, oh. So I passed on it. I was like, it's going to be somebody else's blessing. I gave him names up of some other people. Twice. <laughs> and then he was like, you know, I was like, oh, man. He was like, well, I was like, got to let it go. And then right before, I think it was like, I had like a month off randomly. I was like, oh, man, I got a month off from shooting. And I was talking to Sam because he's a friend. I was like, yo, Sam, I said, did you ever, did you ever find, did you ever get so-and-so? Did you get that person? No, I, 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 I can't cast it. Why? He said, because I really want you for it. I said, well, I have like a month off. Can you, I mean, is that weird? Can you like shoot out all my stuff in a season? And yes, <laughs> because he's the writer, showrunner, and producer. So, so that's how I actually, should. people are wondering like, how, do, how is it possible I'm on two hit shows at one time? Because I, because I deal personally with people the institution is going to do what they're going to do. If I asked permission, it would never happen. But between artists, I'm like, yo, I'll fly from Austin and shoot and be there and fly back 
if we can do this, if we can get our um, AD department on the same page, great. So that's what I do. I do it now. I will shoot one episode of Euphoria. I will go in and shoot a whole episode out in one day, like I did episode one of these episodes, the, one, the last one, the last one that was just premiered. I shot, shot all, all my scenes in one day. They had to just go back to back. And I really flew in from Austin, Texas, where I'm shooting Fear, shot it out in one day, and then flew back. But you, you make it work. And I feel like you, you, it's like, as long as, I always think that as long as you're, if everyone wants to be creative and we all want the same thing, let's try. Let's not, the, you get the business people in the business affairs, they don't want you to do anything because they want to feel like they own you in some way, to be very honest. They want to feel like, oh, no, well, that's, you know, you're our talent and we say no because you want to go do something else. And I just don't ask. I just do it. That's amazing. You can't ask. But, but, but listen, but I think, listen, that's like people like you and I. Come on, let's just be real. It's like if I asked for anything in my career, I wouldn't get it. Mm. I didn't ask you. you sometimes you got to take it or you got to build it and make it happen. You know what I mean? You, you can't sit there and ask somebody because they will usually because just because they they can say no they right. will say no because you, you you keep something else up here that isn't about the fame or the tv or the film like so share the story if you will about what was going in your head right before so Colm was on this really famous tv show i mean he's he is the tv show fear of the walking dead but before this is seven years now Seven years going into our eighth season. That's actually. amazing. That's amazing. She's 22 and she's been acting for seven years. <laughs> well, but take us through because it, it is, I mean, you have this incredible soul, this incredible integrity, but what, just share with these people, because I've heard you talk about this before, where, where your head space and your journey space was at prior to that happening. About where you were a little, you, you know. You, oh, I was about to you quit. And Raul I was, quit, I was quitting York. everything, yeah. to be honest. I was... Yeah, listen. Okay, now we, now we, now he asking me to take the gloves off and really talk. All right. Okay, so that's what we're here for. Cause no, not a lot of people know this, but really, I, I, I came back from. I was blessed to do a show that I, I helped originate from off Broadway to regional theater to, you know, Broadway to, you know, the Young Vic, and then finally the West End. And I did that show called The Scottsboro Boys. It, thank you. It provided so much for me as an artist. I felt like it did everything that I wanted it to do, that I wanted to do as an artist. I felt like I've created a lot, did a lot. But then I came back. I came back from London after I was there off and on for like two years. Came back and I was really frustrated. I had, um, there's other things. I, I had to let go of an, a manager and then I started to really think about, I was like, what am I, I'm 52 now, so I was 42 or 43. And you start, listen, we all know that like a lot of times it's lean times as artists. You know, you, you're making some good money and then, then you're paying off the stuff you didn't pay off for years and you know, you're just constantly in this <laughs> vortex of poverty. <laughs> so, so I came back from what I felt like was a career high and I came back and I was, going on auditions that I felt like that were breaking my soul, to be honest. I felt like I was going in for things like, like I, I'm like, I'm still back at zero again. I can't move the needle on my salary ever. If everyone is, like, like, I still just got here. Am I never going to get ahead? Casting directors not seeing me for things, going into, you know, and constantly going for, um, you know, pilot seasons with, you know, they would do the most disrespectful shit, to be honest. Like, it's amazing the shit that you, we all know the actors have to go through. Like, you're sitting in a lobby, and they've got signs up at ABC, I'll tell exactly where it was, where <laughs> you see people's, you see headshots of people who've booked, who's testing, and then there's you sitting there with nothing. And then, like, you're, and then, and then you're listening to some assistant loudly, loudly, like, right next, over here, talking about, oh, yes, could we like to see that character for this, for the character you're auditioning for. They're, like, bringing in other people, like, so you're like, okay, I just really feel like nothing. I feel like nothing, nothing, nothing. But there was a lot of, over and over again, things that felt like it was really fucking with your soul, and you're like, I don't know if I can do this anymore. I think it's really hurting me. And I'll tell you this, this was, this was the moment, and I'll just say it because we're friends, and I've never really expressed this, but I was going out so much for pilot season, 
but I, I, I honestly feel like that nobody was seeing my tapes. I was constantly doing auditions and self-tapes, you name it, sometimes eight a week, and I was exhausted. And I'm poor, and I'm bartending, and I'm doing this, I'm trying to hustle, and my husband's doing, you know, some, doing flyers on the street and stuff like that. We're trying to make it. I live in an illegal sublet with, you know, horrible neighbors, and it just, it's just awful. It's just awful times, you know, while you're dealing with your personal shit, too, you know. But, you know, but, you, you see what I'm saying? You, you, can I get an amen? Come on, come on, Jesus. All right, listen. Yeah, listen. While you're trying to live, with, deal with your life and your parents are ill or just passed and all that, so you're trying to work it all out. So, picture it. I'm, I'm actually, I remember I auditioned for this one role on Boardwalk Empire, and I really thought, oh my God, this is mine, because the casting director said it was mine, because it was a song and dance man. It was um, the MC of Chalky's Club and all that. And I was like, oh my God, this is, this guy, I need a break. I need something. And I just got back, and I'm like, I just need something to keep going. Some, I need a yes. So my agent calls, and I'm, I'll never forget this. I was at the gym, and I was like, oh my God, this is going to be a yes. Because I auditioned for like nine things that week. I was like, this got to be a yes. It's got to be a yes. And she says, Coleman. Yes. And she's like, um, we heard from Ballwork Empire. I was like, oh God, oh God. And she said, um, the producers loved you. You know where it's going. <laughs> Agents, don't start with that. Don't don't say producers loved you. We all know what's next. <laughs> I don't think Joan Spangler would ever say that to me, though. <laughs> Listen, but I think that uh it really would be, the producers loved you, the showrunners loved you, oh, the director loved you. But and now I, now go back, I put myself on tape like twice in the winning, I wore a tuxedo, I sang, I danced, I learned the song, I did the tap, I did every goddamn thing I could. So I thought it was mine. Everybody loved you. But, one of the researchers, not a researcher. Where'd you get a researcher from? The researcher wasn't in the room. What? Researcher. So one of the researchers noted that the, the hosts in those clubs at that time were light-skinned. I said, they know what I look, look like before I got here. I feel like everybody's fucking with me. I lost my mind, burst into tears in the middle of the gym, burst into tears, like, like he like, like I, I was losing my mind. Oh my God, Coleman, where are you? Where are you? I'll come to where you are. No, I can't take it anymore. I can't do it. I look over into the corner. I can't, I can't do this anymore. I think this is going to kill me. I can't do it. I can't do it. I'll never forget that moment. I go home, and I say to my husband, I said, what would, what would, would it be okay if I stopped doing this? I had a side business. My, you know, I had tons of side hustles. Because <laughs> I'm from Philly, and that's what we did. So I had, a, I had a headshot business. I'm sure it's taken many headshots in here. Thank you, Melissa Carey. Thank you. I've, I've done many headshots. Uh, and, I, and I thought, okay, I, I think, what if I just kept going with my headshot business? And, and you know, let me, let me tell you something. For my friends out there who think that you don't need this, you need love at home, and somebody say, I'll do whatever you want, as long as you're happy. You can leave that. We can leave town if we need to. Great. So I said, great, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going, I'm going to leave. And before I left, this is what happened. I was done. I started to go into my last bit of auditions that I went into. I would go in, and when I was being disrespected, I would take the sides and I would just, I, I wouldn't even do it like in a mean way. I would just take the sides and put them in the trash can as I walked out. I said, I don't need to go into the, to Warner Brothers anymore. I'm good. Isn't that funny? I'm going to be working for Warner Brothers starting on Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't that some shit? But I, I would just say, no, 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 thank you. But, and I would just walk out. Because I started to need, I needed more, I wasn't getting, I, I felt like my self-respect was waning. And I felt so horrible about it all. And I was like, I got to let this go because it's not working out. So as I was on that journey to like let that part of my life go, 
um, one of my good friends, Daniel Breaker, said, you know, my manager's been wanting to meet with you for a while. I'm like, no, nah, I'm good. I don't need any manager. I'm good. I think I'm good. I just meet one time. I said, oh. I really was, okay, whatever. I go into this meeting, and I honestly think it was, it wasn't, I think of myself as being quite charming. But I went to this meeting, and I was anything but. I was like this. They were like, so tell me about yourself. Well, this is what I do. I'm from this, this is what I do, blah, 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 blah. That's what I do. If you think you could work with me, great, fine. I could do it for like six months, and we'll see what happens. It was really like, I gave all fucks. I zero fucks. I was like, nope. Brian Liebman and Corey Richmond, we'd love to work with you. All right. We, we, we love, all right. First thing you gotta do, you have to, we have to let that other person on your team go because that's, that's a thing that hasn't been helping you. Okay, so I had to go in and have a breakup and that would last three hours in tears. And, and then I, this other agency that I've been dancing with, that, again, because I was out. I was like, she was like really like, no, we, they represented me um, for literary. And I was like, but they really wanted to represent me as an actor. When I was out, I was like, oh, we'll see. So I said, okay. Again, I was like, give it six months. And then I had two auditions, two of my first auditions. First, she was very excited, this woman named Elizabeth, who's still my agent, and Brian and Corey are still my managers. Um, Elizabeth said, well, oh my God, there's um, uh, a prequel to uh, The Walking Dead. I'm like, I have no idea what that is. <laughs> um, oh, it's, it's a show, it's an a- apocalyptic, blah, blah, blah. I... Yeah, exactly. She said, well, there's a prequel and there's a character Oh, I think the character is perfect for you. And I really thought, this chick has no idea what I do. <laughs> what, uh, apocalyptic show? I don't, I don't know. So I was, I was all, again, I had such an attitude. I was anything but myself. I was like, all right. And I was like, all right, um, the character is interesting. He's got a monologue. I'm going to wear a blue suit. Raul, can you help put this on tape? I'm going to be, i get this in my head in the next hour and let's just throw it on tape and call it a day. So I do, I really did it pretty quickly. And I was really, this is a great lesson, friends. I did everything I wanted to do in this audition. I was like, this is what I, ca- this is what I think it is. This is the way I think he's dressed. Blah, blah, blah. Fuck it. Take it. I did another audition. I was like, fuck it. Take that too. And then, and then I get a call on, a, on Thursday. And my agent says, oh my God, Coleman. Um, Really good news for you. What? Um, one of them was the get down with Boz Lerman. I said, oh, Boz loves you. And we think you're going to be getting an offer. I said, oh, well, that's great. It's shoots in New York. It's a get down. Oh, my God, that's really good. But there's a complication now. What's the complication? Fear the Walking Dead. What's that? The, the, the audition about the apocalyptic... I, mean, I, I didn't know what it was. I was like, oh, okay, yeah. Now, this was a self-tape. It was, it was one self-tape. I said, oh, I said, okay. They said, okay, well, we'll, we'll, we'll know no more tomorrow, and we'll figure out what it is. The next day comes, and the thing that is the most unusual thing that I believe that happened to me was, you're getting an offer to be a series regular on Fear the Walking Dead. And I thought, but, but I... But, they didn't put me through hoops and I didn't fly to LA and meet with all these people and what I had been doing. It was just an honest, sincere yes. And it was something that said and pulled at me. And, I, and, and it, was, it was a great yes. And I got a, the get down sort of went away because they wouldn't sort of allow both to happen. And so I went, with the, I went where the love and the energy was going. I said, let me do something new. And they, they, came, they came 100 with love. And who am I supposed to, you know, turn that away? I'm like, they just said, we, we, you're our guy. We don't need to put you through hoops. And I thought, but also I believe, I look back at it now, to be honest, Sean, and I think, well, maybe it's because I, I stopped putting myself through hoops, too, to be honest. And I feel like the universe is treating me the way I treat myself, you know? Absolute. And also, prior to that, bro... We were, they had this apartment in, in, in Hell's Kitchen, a little thing. You know, I'm, I'm from California, so all of this shit looks small to me. But they had, like, one of these Hell's Kitchen joints. Like, I'm sleeping over. Where the fuck am I sleeping? <laughs> so I was in the closet. 
literally and but Coleman we, we, I always remember we were sitting out on you know they got a little f uh, fake little terrace you know about 17 inches long you'd be like eh. but but it overlooks what they called the theater row there and we're looking to play Rise Horizon have a friend had a play there but I said, so, you know, and to me, Coleman's always been blowing up. So I was like, you blowing up, man? You had, and he had done several films. There was one director in particular, you know, kind of a, a rising star, great uh, film director, represent black people. And you have a black actor of the highest order. Mm -hmm. My book is about to do a, a TV show. And he was this close and he didn't get it. And I was like, you, gotta find out. you know, how did you not get the thing? And it really, it really fucked me up. I was like, well, how, I don't understand how it works then. If the motherfucker worked with you and you put out your soul, they captured your soul on film, everyone was feeling it, and motherfucker went around the world kicking it with you outside the film, then I don't understand. I don't understand how the circle works. So I was really, I was really upset for you, but Coleman in his head was said, well, I started writing this play. I'm going to write this play, and the play's about my family. Yeah. And that was the beginning phases of a play, Dot, which is an incredible piece. Yeah. And where, where are people from New Conservatory Theater? Show out. Show out. We in the theater. No, no waving. Just, you got to make some noise. Okay. Thank you, Sean Jay. So they are going to turn out this play which has had a long life a beautiful life and it is everything everything that it, it is common it's all you know the word soul has been said you know over a dozen times no no coincidence and that was all I was all I mean really about your mother you know and I think it's about our mothers well I mean that's 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 really to sort of spin it all the way all the way all the way back when, when Coleman and I met, and then we started to kick it, you know, you, you're younger, and you like the same music, this, that, and the other. But we both recognized that we were mama's boys, like <laughs> tried and true, like mama, 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 mama's hardcore. boys. Hardcore. Not even like a little bit with pop, just like mama's boys. <laughs> and and we, always, we always carried that with us, and I just, I admire and am moved so much by how much your mother's spirit, you know, we're talking about all these things. We go, how, how could you get that? And how did that land? It's spirit. I agree. Yeah, it, you know, it's 100% spirit. And I know we're in the Bay Area. It's too cool for school to talk about religion and faith and whatnot. <laughs> I do it every day. But th th that's the truest thing that there can be. And so Raul and Coma now have a production company. It's called Edith Productions because Coma Mama's name is Edith. And she, she, she's always guided everything you've been doing. But I bring that up about that story on the 17-inch terrace because it grounded <laughs> Coleman in a way that it, you're, in, you're in the face. Y'all heard that shade? Y'all heard that shade real quick? Mm -hmm. I'm from the Bay. We, we like a little bit of space. We like a little bit of space. And so uh, I just remember that. So in the face of... The, he tells us this story about where you in the gym and you said, fuck it. But... Prior to that, you weren't you. Your soul, your creativity, your core—what the word I've been using a lot—and it's kind of an accidental bite from the great Luis Valdez—is your vibration. Yes. What you vibrate, yeah. that never, ne never, never stopped. Yeah. So even if this motherfucker said, "Fuck it, no agent, no," I think my daughter's here tonight, and I've been cussing. <laughs> it's just, I just you realized. just remembered. You just realized it. You just realized. It's okay. It's, a, it's just another language that we speak together, sweetheart. But it's true. But, but, I, but I do believe that. I, I think that that's what is one of the most important things is to trust that vibration and, uh, and the people that you have around you. And that's the one thing I do trust. I, if I don't trust anything else, I trust you know when it's good and you know when it's not good. It's just about the choice that you have to make to exhume them <laughs> or, or draw them closer. You know, yeah, that's but all we it, have. It, it's also what you, you hold on to. So Coleman left the Bay Area over, over 22 years ago. Tell Doesn't secrets. feel like it, though, Tell does it? Secrets. Yeah, I know, right? Because I'm doing the math. I'm like, that means that we... Yes. I was in New York for 16, and now I'm in L.A. for five. Amazing. But so 
while he was grinding all over the world and all over the, you know, London, England, Paris, Munich, doing it all, um, Coleman, um, Coleman always saw me. So he would, he would call me and, and just pluck a motherfucker out of, out of nowhere and be like, no, we, we are doing something together. And I say that not because it, it melts my heart, which it really does, but it, that power, yeah. if, we don't, if we don't believe in each other, yeah. who the fuck else is going to believe in it? If we don't believe in each other, we're doing, come on, man, we're doing theater. Come on. Come on. Come on. You have to really, you got to uh, you gotta put your fingernails in the dirt to do this stuff. And if you don't have that lift, and if you don't have the community, if you don't have the hug, and if you don't have the embrace, it's just, it, that's why you were on the terrace with me. But this you is, I'm, pulled now, me out there. Now I'm going to tell, tell something. Now I'm going to turn the tables. Because I, because I wanted to... Just for us to examine why we're here as well with this man's uh, new leadership. And this is something, this is something he didn't take lightly. This is something we talked about for weeks. And I must admit, I was like, we would, because we lay out questions for each other. So we know why we're stepping into something. And we say, so um, he had all the reasons, because he'll stack up all the reasons why he shouldn't do it. And I'm like, so who you think supposed to do it? Because actually you're the perfect person to do it. And why I know he's perfect to do it is because he will check off all these reasons why he shouldn't. That is a humble soul. That is a servant. That's someone who is thinking bigger than himself always. And he's thinking, but if somebody else can do it better than me or stronger or smarter or something like that, or have more access and bring him more money, then they should do it. But I thought, no, but you've got the soul of it. In the soul, you, you're, you're an artist who has made such extraordinary choices. And I say this because we are very much alike. And I know that I don't think I'm more talented than anybody else. I know that I could have continued to make a career here and dig in deep. But I, I, I'm a, a bit of a butterfly. But also I love the fact that my friend has dug his roots in deeper and believes in the soul of the creative spirit of this city, of this bay. And he invests in it, invests, and he wants to draw more. So, of course, part of his, you know, I already let him know when he asked me to be on the board. I said, well, you know, I'm not going to be like some regular board member because I'm just too, I, got, I, I can't think like that. What I can do, I, I will call on my superhuman powers once in a while and come in and swoop in. <laughs> And get behind you, because I think that's what everyone must do. And that's what I'm going to ask you all to do as well. That this is a, it's not, and you know what? And, and listen, I'm going to say something, too. That's a wonderful comment. But I'm going to say, but, but, because we always think it's about the pocketbook. I think it's about so much more. I think if we're just the board shaking people down for money, we're not doing our jobs. We need, you, we need access. We need connection. We need each other. We need people to reinvest in each other to show up in different ways outside the box. You know what I mean? To say, hey, this is the way we can do it. If we're gonna reimagine theater, this is the way we have to reimagine theater. We can't bring in some old shit that didn't work before. Break it down, break it down. If we say we're supposed to smash this shit, what the fuck, I said, I want, listen, this is the way I am on, um, when people ask me to be on the board. What, so what do you wanna do with the American theater? I said, smash it with a goddamn sledgehammer. Because I care about it that much. I want to smash it open and rebuild it for people like us. For everyone that's here to say that theater belongs to you. Okay? That it's yours. And that's the only way it can continue to thrive and survive. And that's why I charge myself. I say, oh no, that's why I will be here with you. And I will do what I can to make sure that you create the theater that you want to create for us. Amazing. So that's what that's what we're doing. So the the the, the first call I made before uh, before I, I moved in and moved all of us into the Magic Theater was our, our Carl Coleman, and he really did 
it's like when I listen to Warriors games. I go out. If they go down one point, I'm like, it's over. One. The whole season's over. <laughs> so it's the same with this thing. I said, fuck it. It could never work. Why would they ever do that? Why would they put us at the center of the thing? Why would, why would they dismantle the system in order to create more access for people? Why would they accept the thing that I said, said we are going to rightfully, hear the word, rightfully center people of color throughout the organization? Now, don't get it twisted and don't get scary about it. All that means is that's, that's where we rightfully belong. And everyone can radiate and vibrate off of that. We've done it for centuries and centuries the other way around. So don't get scary about it. It's all good. It's all love. This is the bay. So it's still going to happen that way. And we, but we, we want to do it from all the way to the top down. That's why Coleman is the first person I call. I say, not like, Coleman, I need you to act. Coleman, would you ever perform? Would you... Give us one of your plays. We're doing that, too. But I said, what we need to do is have you on the board for exactly what he said, to smash it down. Smash doesn't, not just to destroy, we have to redefine the shit for ourselves. We have accepted it for so long as the thing, but if the thing don't talk back to us, what use is it for us who are alive and doing it? There are libraries and museums for that. Move on. So that's what we're going to do. And l let me promise you this, two things. Come, we're going to be on the board as long as I'm going to be there. And also, I'm no dummy. This is the most talented person I know. So we're doing, we're developing two, not one. I, why, why fuck around? I'm from the mission. We're fucking two new pieces that Coma's developed. They're ready to go, people. <laughs> They're ready to go, people. But, but here's the thing, and, and Smiley is right. Coma's right. It is about love, and, but this is a benefit. So it is also about... It is about money, too. Yeah. <laughs> so, friends, you can't families, do, You can't do it all with a heart and a, a, a song and a prayer, right? But, uh, yeah, well, well, Sean has been really um, harassing me for years to, uh, to do a couple of my pieces. One that has been sort of held up with, because um, it was it was developed with another uh, with a producer, and now we're 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 getting it back because because it bees like that, and we got, we got to make sure we own our work. But it, it's I, it's a musical that I've worked on. It's uh, the film. It's the musical adaptation of the film Tangerine, <laughs> and it's um and the I wrote the book, and the music is written by Dev Hines of Blood Orange. So it's it's kind of it's kind of cool it's kind of cool so uh, so yeah and then um, there's another and and thank you that's pretty saucy right and then there's another piece of mine that was actually developed um, by uh, you know it was commissioned by ACT actually um, many years ago uh, it was part of Monstress actually but um, you know I don't know mine was a little too wild I think or something yes but but but, but also we know that it's it's very um, I don't know it's a Leslie Tenorio short story called The Brothers. And it's really beautiful, and it's small, but it, it packs a punch, and I think it's just kind of magic. It's magical, it's just about family, it's about religion, it's about um, the transgender community, it's about communities, and it re it's a really special piece. And it hasn't seen the light of day in a, a pro production yet. It's one of those that have sort of sat quietly in my, my drawer for a while. And Sean is like, no, dust that off. I think we need to do it. So that's something that we're going to collaborate on and figure out how we're going to do it, whether we co-direct it or whatever. I don't know what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. John, we got that on tape. We got that on tape. I'm cool. All right, we can go home. No, this, this is amazing. But this is what we need to marry it with. Everything that Coleman is saying about community, soul, spirit, vibration, whatever you're going to call it, work. And, and we also need the support because... Where's Deborah, my old dear Shiro, Deborah Cullinan? Deborah we, Cullinan, there she is. We used to do Intersection for the Arts together, and that was like the dream. If anyone went there back in the day, it, it had everything. It had visual arts, it had yep. jazz, it had poetry, it had dance, it had theater, and it had real community, like real, real community. And the city, the world, the economy, 
the fake ass press, they make it so hard for it not to exist and no one wants to show up. Everyone wants to be there for the thing, but no one wants to show up. And when I say show up, I mean show what? Yeah. Like show what? Like don't say I liked your thing or you're dope or that's cool, I heard about her, this, that, and the other. You have to show up if you care about it. Or say fuck it and just watch movies and shit. But if you want stuff to exist, it really exists in your city, and this is the greatest fucking city in the world. Sorry, West Philly. Yeah. Then you gotta, you gotta represent, you gotta show up and show out. Just every now and then, just a little bit, just a little bit. I'm not asking for everything, but you know, we, we work my man Juan Amador to death. We take nine out of 10 days out of him. We don't take all 10, so we're not asking for 10 days. But I'm serious, so that's what we're asking for can you I, can to show some, up. Can yeah, I ask something else too, um, just in terms of like, of showing up? There, things that I think that we can do to show up by saying, hey, it's not about you. It's a lot of times you dipping into your pocket. If you got some, something you can give, that's wonderful. But if you have access to Merrill Lynch, to Google, to whatever, to, for somebody to underwrite you know, a, a show or something like that, that's how you know, I, I established some awards with another theater because an under someone who's like, oh, well, that's part of, I want to do that, my mission. So they underwrite it every year. But I feel like there's access. There's other things you can do. I don't think it's always got to come out of your pocket. You know, it can, it, you know, you have access and resources. Help build the theater that you want to build. Ooh. Ooh. No, because you're right, and this is where, where Philly comes into it. The people power, I got a supervisor right here who can tell you that's 100, 100, 100. People power is the real power. Politics is one thing, but the people power is the real thing. And all of us theater people, we allow ourselves to sit in the corner and look at, if you, if you, if you colored or if you othered in any way, we've been living our whole lives in the corner. And then, and then we get into theater, and so we're in a corner, inside of a corner, and we go, that's just the way it is. No, it's not just the way it is. And so we don't ever acknowledge the power that we have. We are powerful. We are a part of the civic Life. Do you understand what I'm saying? The civic life. You walk up two more blocks. We're part of that because what we're doing is engaging in real thought with real people about real issues and real themes in real time. And so to, to sort of put yourselves and ourselves in a box that like we do a little entertainment. It's cute with this, that, and the other. You could do it on Friday. You could do it on Sunday afternoon. Forget about it. No, that's not what we're talking about here. That's not what this space is talking about. That's not what the Magic Theater is talking about. It's not why the Bay Area and San Francisco in particular has more dance and theater companies at the low, low levels than any other place on the planet. It's because we believe in that and we believe in responding to our world. So that's, that's the kind of thing that we're talking about. It, you know, and and we can break the mold, people. We have, where's my, my friend Jerome? Jerome Gentis, right here. What? Give him a little, but you can give him a lot in a minute. When we say that we need support and access, Jerome, my friend here, my Indian brother right here, represents his community in the desert, the native people, and he's coming back here to tell those stories and other stories of the magic. What we're doing, we're gonna break the whole mold of the shit where anyone can produce and everyone can gain access to it. Do you hear what I'm saying? Anyone can produce and everyone can gain access. I don't think you hear me. I come from San Francisco, I grew up on the Say fucking- Say it again to the people in the back. This is what I'm saying though. I, I grew up on Muni and I never knew what the inside of ACT looked like. I grew up on fucking Muni and I grew up up and down that 38 year and I never knew what looked like inside of the current theater. I grew up on Muni and I rode that 47. I never knew what the fuck the symphony looked like inside. But it's out, these are, right Matt, these are our spaces too, right? So, you, but we all have to do that. We all have to open up the door. So using these words and Pam and Jennifer, this is not slander, this is the way we're doing it. We're getting rid of this thing called subscribership. For people like me, subscriber is a word that I don't understand. Well, I'm just saying, what we're trying to do is get real people into the real space in real time. And so we can remove some of these words, but keep the doors open. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna have dope, crazy, amazing artists, but we're also gonna have amazing access to it. But I, I'm really, this is gonna be the hard pitch and then you're gonna have fun, come and we'll look cute and everything like that. <laughs> you gotta show up for it. And so we've made it possible. We have a thing called a season pass. Liam Vincent, our, our director of growth. <laughs> this one gets a bigger chair than me and they didn't even see you. What the fuck? 
Oh, Liam Vincent. Liam Vincent is, is you know, th what it does is it takes people from the community to give back to the community. So can, Liam's an amazing actor, been acting in the Bay Area longer than me and Carl. We <laughs> longer did our, than we, us, we, No, we did our first show together, exactly, with Danny Shea. In the basement, in the basement of Theater Rhino, me and Liam <laughs> Vincent cut our teeth. Right. And so... We created this thing that Liam had to a season pass. So what we're doing, we have all residencies throughout the building, stole all the good shit from Deborah at Intersection, and we're doing it at the Magic Theater. We're still doing the bold new plays. Don't get scary about it. We're still doing bold new plays, but we have residents because what we need right now, more than anything, we need space. If you have space, you can get home. Like I said, if you have home, then you can have family. You have family, you can have community. You have community, you can do any fucking thing. So that's what we're doing. We open it up, Lorraine Hansberry Theater. Please tell Margo that I said this. Manny, I don't want her chewing me out. We have B-A-C-C-E, Ellen, Ellen Sebastian Chang and Soon He Chang. That's just the beginning of it. We have a new curator, Juan Amador, a Renaissance man. We have a playwright in residence, Star French, the greatest writer writing today. Let me repeat it so you can mark this day down. The greatest writer writing today, Star French, is in the audience. You should meet her. She from the future, children. Catch up. I got a whole row of, of artists right here for Ashley Smiley, Jasmine Milan Williams, Brittany Frazier, Chris Salceda. It's all artists, because that's what we need to do. We need to fill the space with ourselves. So we're going to do a whole year. And it already started with an incredible play. And Dara's out here throwing her soul on that stage, the kind ones. And we're going to give you dance, music, poetry, and plays. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to give you two plays, world premiere plays. And this is why I know Pam and Jennifer is nice. We're going to outsell them in their own goddamn house. We're going to do two world premiere plays and two other choices that you want from our dance poetry plays for $100. No, a, a buck, a buck, $100, not for one show, for four. You can come any night, you can pick any seat you want. And if you can give more, then give more, people. Make it possible for others to go. You know our school system, tell me I'm right, Matt, they ain't giving to the arts. So you all can give to the arts. If you don't want to go for yourself, buy 10 of those tickets. We're going to have 10 students. So someone like me, who's smarter than me, could go and watch some plays and some performances out there. Come on, come on man. Sell some tickets. Sell some tickets, boy. I, <laughs> I think that was the, the, the best sales pitch right no, there. Oh, girl. I, 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 I want to ask <laughs> Not one more. better than you. <laughs> no, that was good. I wanted to add one more thing, too. For those who came to this event tonight in search of community, in search of their artistic home. Just know that there's a place for you too. You can, you can also just, you can volunteer. You can say, you can reach out and say, how can I be a part of it? What can I do? I have time. That's all you need. I ran into a friend, old, old friend of mine who said to me upstairs, says, this is so nice. I, I really want to be around more artists. Well, this is your home. So just ask how you can be involved. Look around. This is your community. People who came in just for this event to hear some stories from an old showboy like myself. <laughs> you, can, you, you can look around and say, this is your community, so be a part of it, all right? Showboy. There's many ways. Oh, wow, showboy. <laughs> OK. We went over a little bit. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a press, I'm gonna do the hard press in a minute. But before we do that, can we do, can we take a couple of questions? If people have a couple questions of stuff we didn't touch, like two, three, two, three max, and we'll do it like that. Oh, look, lovely. Stephanie has a mic. If anyone got a question. Oh. You can use your theater voice. Go ahead. <laughs> How do I navigate um, the emotional complexity of some work? How am I able to do that? That's a great question. I think that I think that it always. I think I've always believed that the work that we do is service. That you give. You've got to get. It's something I I I teach as well, and I tell my students I want them to give a little, give a little bit of their soul, and they've got to give it even in an audition. It's got to cost you something. Otherwise, why do it? 
that's, that's actually my job, actually, is to get out of my own way and to, let it, and to let it flow through me, whatever that is. And to trust that that is whatever. There's the, there's the craft of it. Yes, that's one thing. But then there's the soul part of it that I know that's, that, that's the hard work, but it's the necessary work. And that's what gets me up to do the work that I do all the time. That's my investment in humanity, I think. And so that's why you, you're like, oh, no, I just have to pour all that I can into it. There's some things that are more difficult than others that have to call on things that are, I'll be honest, the things that I'm drawn to scare me a little bit. And I do know that, like, I'm about to go on this journey. Do I know what myth is going to bring out in me? What he's going to call on from even my own natural father being terrible to my mother before my mother found my wonderful stepfather? Is it going to call on things like that, my own trauma? It might, but that's also my job, and hopefully that's something that's going to help move me through and move me forward and let me have empathy even for that in some way. So I think it's part of my job, and you just sort of get out of the way and trust that whatever it is, it's useful and it's in service. That's it. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, back there, Steph, I think. Hi, uh, thank you for coming. Um, I really love Passing Strange. I actually had to, I had to watch it in one of my classes. Um, thank you. Something that I was wondering, you're such a multifaceted artist. You've been on stage, off stage, you're producing. Is there something that you want to do as an artist that you haven't fulfilled yet? That's a great question. I would say the thing that keeps coming up for me is something that I never imagined myself doing, and I had a taste of it. I'm starting to get more tastes of it now. I've always been sort of the outlier. Passing Strange, that show was made for somebody like me. It was, we were nothing but outliers, all of us. We were geeks and weirdos and... You know, who else would write a show and say, oh, we want you to play a closeted choir director or a German performance artist and a Dutch nudist? Oh, me. That's for me. There was nothing else for me but that. That made sense. But I do think that I think that by being an outlier, I think that I think maybe the industry and maybe myself thought I was something else and I wasn't to play certain roles until, again, people see you. And I had a moment to... I had one moment to play for one night only for Adam Driver's company um, for Arts and Armed Forces. And they were doing Raisin in the Sun. And I played Walter Lee. And I never, m my friend Patricia McGregor, wonderful director, who worked at Cal Shakes, she, um, she said, oh, I think you'd be wonderful. I, 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 oh. Okay, I honestly would just say, okay, I'll, well, it's reading, it's okay, I'll do it. And, some, and suddenly, it lived in me in a way that I had no idea. And um, it, it's something, it shook me to my core. And I thought, wow, I, I think I want to live in these words of Lorraine Hansberry and in this role of this man who was in the center. I, again, it's one of those things where it's like, I actually don't think that I moved into the center of playing leading man roles until I saw it for myself. It wasn't happening until finally I saw myself playing these roles and then, the, and then suddenly I'm playing these leading man roles. So I would like to play to actually do a full production of A Raisin in the Sun. Wow. It's so classic, wow. which is, it may be alarming to people like, oh, not a new play, no, I want, I want to do that. And then when I'm older, because I look so very young, I want to do Fences, and I want to play Troy. I want to, I want to play these great men. You know what I mean? I want to play these great men. Hey, friend, how you doing? Good to see you. I, oh, I'm about to cry. I'm just seeing people I love. Hey, honey, good to see you. Thank you. Uh, for those who didn't hear, we're talking about um, the disease of addiction and the, my role in euphoria. 
and the responsibility and how do I find the way to be a part of telling that story. It all starts with Sam Levinson, our writer, director, showrunner, who suffered with the disease of addiction, still does, of course, um, and it meant the world to him to depict this and everyone to be so humanized and complex. Euphoria is many things. That show, I think, it just spins off its axis. But it's really looking at our culture. That's what I think. I think if, for the people who look, oh, I can't watch that, or they're so alarmed by the things that teenagers are doing or saying or whatever, I'm like, but you got to look a little deeper, actually. I think that that's what Sam Levinson is always asking us. He, he, he gave me this beautiful episode, this special episode with Zendaya, and it's just two people sitting at a cafe and a diner talking on Christmas Eve. And for me, I didn't want to take that lightly. I literally got that episode when it was the day that Trump invoked that Insurrection Act. And I was, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And I was like, what the fuck is going on? And I was in my office constantly like a maniac. And I was so upset. And, and in my inbox, Sam sent this to me. And it felt like um, a call to action. It felt like a prayer. It came from, it really came from his spirit. It was like, it was what he wanted to say to America, to our culture, to not only the disease of addiction, but to, you know, examining uh, revolutions and what we believe in and what we're taught, really examine it in a bigger picture that we're all sick because we've all been fed this, that we're all suffering from the disease of addiction in some way. It could just be Twitter. It could be the news. It could be, it could be something. It could be your love. It could be it's whatever it is. It's all part of the same thing. And so for me, it was unpacking all this stuff. And I've already done, I've done so much research when it comes to uh, the disease of addiction when it comes to just having conversations with people who suffer, who still suffer, uh, with research, with documentaries, you name it, whatever I can get in to make sure that I never judged anyone, but to just humanize them and to understand it as a disease and a sickness in that way. So I did that work. But that one episode in particular, I made sure because I felt like there was a huge responsibility for it. I, I put myself into my office for like 40 hours a week for three weeks and rehearsed. I did what I've always done. I'm from the theater. I'm like, oh, he's giving me 60 pages of dialogue and four-page monologues. No time to get scared. This is Alpha Fugard. This is August Wilson. You've done this before. You always look at scripts and think, I'll never memorize that. And you do, don't we? We all do, don't we? We all say, oh, I'll never get that. <laughs> but then you go step by step, page by page, beat by beat, line by line, and you just work it out. And then the most important part for me with that process was then to just show up and get out of the way, to trust that 